Thanks so much for coming, everybody. So I thought maybe I would just take you on the Love Never Dies experience with me, and I'll just sort of bring you through the book, OK? And I'll start where the book begins. From the time I was a young girl, I had a detailed premonition of the man that I was going to marry. I saw him fleshed out. I saw his face. I saw his body, so I just said, I'm going to wait until he appears. I didn't date. This was very medieval, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I waited, and he did appear on the first day of my freshman year at Vassar College. I had been shut out of all intro sociology classes, and I wanted desperately to take sociology. So I went to the department chair's secretary, Judy, and I said, how can I get into intro soc? And she said, go ask the department chair, Jean Pain, if he can find a seat for you in one of the closed sections. Well, the minute I stepped into Jean's office, I had the first and only out-of-body experience I'd ever had in my life. I felt my soul shooting at high speed through a tunnel to the end of my life. And then when I shot back into my body, I got the message, remember every aspect of this meeting, he's going to be everything to you one day. And then I forgot. Now, right after meeting Jean, I discovered that for most of his life, he had been one of the most famous Jesuit priests in history. He had taught at the Vatican. He founded a movement called Liberation Theology, designed to fight church oppression from within. And he actually launched to international fame when he publicly opposed the Pope and the Catholic Church as they were trying to block the legalization of divorce. And he was this radical feminist Jesuit priest. He didn't want to see women trapped in marriages where they were being abused. So he fought on the grounds of religious freedom. The church should butt out of the private sector. So he fought the pope and the Catholic church, and he won. And he got the divorce bill passed, and soon after, the Pope granted him the dispensation of his vows. He left the Jesuit order and the priesthood without being excommunicated, and he was recruited by Vassar, where I met him 10 years later. Now, I should say at this point, my background was completely different. I was raised by two devoutly atheist Jewish parents. <laughs> <laughs> the only religion my parents practiced was religiously hating each other's guts. Okay, they, they taught me not to believe in God or the afterlife. I never went to synagogue or church, obviously. So now, four years after the fated meeting with Jean, in my senior near, year, I needed help with the statistical portion of my thesis. And I had heard that, among other things, Jean had been a statistician having founded the Vatican's first and only social research center. So, like a damsel in distress, very medieval again, I asked him if he could help me with the statistical portion of my thesis, and even though he wasn't my advisor, he cheerfully gave me his time. And within a couple of weeks, we knew. We were crazy for each other. We were twins separated at birth, despite our different religions, cultures, backgrounds, generations. We were soulmates and twins. So, we were together, inseparable, for 27 years. We wrote books together. We restored houses together. We rejoiced in every moment that we spent together. In the last year of his physical life, we started having a premonition he was going to die of an accident. We just didn't know when or where. So we go to Italy on our final vacation. The day we leave, 40 crows appear in the backyard big black crows, and then lightning strikes our rose arbor. And I think, this is not good. <laughs> this is not good. So we go anyway, and we're sitting on the beach. And I'll never forget, he has his hand up over his head like this, as if to block the rays of the sun, when a bee swoops down and stings him at the exact location of Christ's stigmata. And I watch my beloved suffocate to death in front of my eyes. Well, I can't describe to you the trauma of having him ripped from me in this way. So I go back to the hotel room, and I'm lying on the bed, and I'm shaking, and I'm trembling, and I'm crying. And the next thing I know, I feel that man's hand stroke the entire length of my spine. I sit bolt upright, and I look over my shoulder. Well, I don't see anything, but he was there. 
And he has been with me ever since that moment. His astonishing, outrageous manifestations of his presence in front of witnesses to this day have proven to me we don't die. And therefore, our relationships are not meant to end in death. And so I've created a groundbreaking new, what I call trans-dimensional grief therapy method that completely diverges from the Western grief therapy approach. Bigger game, right? Uh, the Western approach being grieve, let go, and move on, and do it in six months, or else we're going to tell you you have a psychiatric condition and we're going to drug you. My method, by contrast, shows you how to say hello, not goodbye, and how to do this without the assistance of a medium, a channeler, or a psychic. And there's one more thing. As a shrink, I also know that the Western approach to grief therapy gives us no way of working out unfinished business. The idea is, if you didn't work it out and that person died, you're SOL. But thankfully, Love Never Dies offers the first vehicle in history for not only reconnecting, but making peace with the deceased. So part one of Love Never Dies picks up from the night that I felt Jean's hand stroking my spine. So I'll tell you a few of the little examples. And you know, you have to, Time Life book series, read the book to get all the examples, but I'll give you a few. So I come back from Italy, and of course, the first night back, I haven't slept a wink. And I come down to the kitchen the next morning, and I hear Jean say to me, Jamie, open the kitchen door. I want to show you something. So I open the door, and what I see sitting right here next to me is a chipmunk. And the chipmunk is frozen as if in a trance. Now, normally a chipmunk would freak when you're that close and run away. But this chipmunk doesn't. He holds completely still, and his eyes start to close. And then I watch him mimicking my husband's bodily departure. He starts ripping at his little face like this. And he's mimicking the way my husband was ripping at the oxygen mask because the air wasn't getting into his lungs. And of course, tears are raining down my cheeks as I'm watching this little creature recreate my husband's bodily departure. And after 20 minutes of this, I see that chipmunk visibly cough up a wonk of mucus, and he's in peace. Now, I knew Jean was telling me through this little animal. I've since dubbed animals, both domestic and wild, as open vessels, because they are natural open vessels for spirit to speak to us. So this little open vessel was being used by Jean to tell me, I'm OK, Jamie. Now, soon after that, I have to fax his death certificate to Verizon. Throughout the day, I had sent many multi-page faxes, no problem. But when I go to fax his death certificate, the cover letter goes through without a hitch, but the machine will not fax his death certificate. So now I try with the obit. Cover letter faxes without a hitch, the obit will not go. Did you see? I knew he was going to do this. <laughs> he told me he was going to mess with the electronics at the fax point, and he did. It gets wilder. So I try, you don't know, I haven't, I haven't landed for years. So, so, uh, so I try 20 times, it doesn't work. So the next day, I go to my lawyers. I don't say anything, I just hand the documents to the secretaries and I say, would you do me a favor, fax these for me to Verizon. I'm waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting after about 20 minutes. All the secretaries come out crying their eyes out. They said, Jamie, we tried 20 times. Every time, the cover letter goes without a hitch, but the death certificate and the obit will not fax. He is telling you he's not dead. So I go home, and again, I have to do this fax deal somewhere else, and again, he hangs up the death certificate. So I stand in the middle of the room, and I say to him, Jean, listen, I think you're doing this because I keep forgetting that you're still here. If I promise, see, if I promise to keep in mind that you're here, will you let this fax go through in its entirety? I cancel the fax. I feel a tidal wave of love pour into me, and the fax goes through in its entirety. So now my life is starting to become even weirder. Wherever I go, strangers, if you think that's weird, so strangers walking up to me, don't know me, didn't know Jean, they say, your husband says, tell our story, and they walk on. 
happens to me hundreds of times. Now one day, I'm driving in my car, and I feel the need to pray to him. This is pretty strange. Remember, two devout Jewish atheists, right? So I start to pray, and the prayer I issue is, Jean, please help my friend Emily find love. Now, he never knew Emily. He never met her. She never met him. She never saw a photo even of him. As I issue the prayer, I again feel that tidal wave of love. I look at the dashboard clock, 4.58. That night, my phone rings. It's Emily. She says, Jamie, you will not believe what happened. What happened? She says, at 4.58, I fell into a trance. Your husband appeared to me. She describes him to a T. She says, he told me to find love, follow the gray stones to the church in your neighborhood. That was the words of my prayer, help her find love. The next week I go to my professional group. She's a member in the group, she tells the story. Another member of the group named Mitch Wood, a former seminarian, says to her, what's the name of the church he sent you to? She says, the Claremont Church. He says, oh my God, the Claremont Church is New York City's only liberation theology seminary. So he put his stamp on that manifestation in more than one way. Okay, so now I'm just gonna give you one more example before we go to part two of Love Never Dies. So this is the use of earthly props, which telephones, electronic devices. One day I'm on the, floor crying in my closet, which was a hobby in the early days of my grief. <laughs> Just tell it the way it is, right? So I'm lying on the floor, and I am thinking, I have to call my friend Anne. No, don't bother her. It's the middle of her work day. I got to talk to her. After 20 minutes of this, in my mind, my phone rings. I drag myself up out of the closet. I run to get the phone. It's Anne. She says, Jamie, did you call? I said, no, Anne, but I tell her what I was thinking. She says, but Jamie, my phone rang, and your name and number appeared on the caller ID. So we knew he's a sentient being. He knew I was in trouble. He knew I wanted to talk to her, so he put my name and number on her caller ID and rang her phone. A year later, I have a very bad chest cough. I cannot breathe, and I'm thinking, I'm going to suffocate to death the way he did. So I say to him aloud, Jean, please do that caller ID phone trick again. Prove to me I'm not alone here. Do this for me. Do it with my housekeeper, Donna. Two seconds later, my phone rings. It's Donna. She says, Jamie, did you call? I said, no, Donna. I said, and I tell her, and she said, my phone rang and your name and number appeared on the caller ID. So now I go to my writer's group. Gabe Davis, a devout Jewish atheist, has been hearing all the stories of my manifestations from Jean, and he says, you know, Jamie, I'd like to see that caller ID phone trick repeated, and this time I'd like to see whether your phone shows in the call log that it was manipulated to dial the other person even though you didn't use it. So I forget his challenge altogether, and a month later, I'm due to meet Gabe and his wife Robin for dinner, and I'm driving behind them, and all of a sudden, I again feel that tidal wave of love. I look at the clock, it's 4.58 again. I get to the restaurant, Gabe rushes up to me like a stampeding elephant. He says, Jamie, you will not believe what happened. That's what happened. He said, at 4.58, my cell phone rang. He said, I looked at the caller ID, your name and number appeared. He said, I picked the call up, and a man's voice said, is Jamie there? Is Jamie there? He said the voice had an accent and prolonged the syllable there. Well, Jean was French, you might have gathered. And he did prolong that syllable. It sounded like there. He said it wasn't a real call. The voice just faded away and the call never clicked off. He says, go get your phone. See if it dialed me. So I dig into the bottom of my purse. I hadn't used the phone all day. 4.58, my phone dialed him. So what is the point of all these over-the-top manifestations? The point is, this is what Jean told me right after he left his body. Jamie, let our love shine like a torch that lights the path for others. So he wants me to tell you that your loved ones are here with you too. 
They're just waiting for you to open the door of your heart and let them back in. So in part two of Love Never Dies, I focus on helping you overcome all the BS that you've been taught <laughs> that blocks your reconnection, all the false teachings, everything that gets in the way. So I'll just tell you a couple, and then you can you know, see all the rest of it in part two. And then the second half of part two is about how does this even happen? How is it possible? Because there's a lot of science behind this that can explain it. So here's one, a really common, common block. We're not supposed to stay in touch with those in spirit. It's not even possible anyway. Now, how did I find out that this is not true? My first night back from Italy, the night I was lying awake, Jean quoted something to me that I did not recognize. The next day, I go to his priest to meet him for the first time to prepare the readings for his funeral. And I say to the priest, Jean's quoting something to me. I don't know what it is. So the priest raises his brow like, yo, this babe has really lost her marbles, right? But then when I tell the priest what Jean said, the priest blanches. He crosses himself and he says, dear God, Jamie, at first I did not believe that Jean was speaking to you, but I do now. He said, you are quoting an obscure biblical passage from the communion of saints. Like I would know. <laughs> it took me a year to understand why Jean chose to quote that and only that passage. Remember, he was a religious pioneer in life. He continues to be in the afterlife. The communion of saints says that our loved ones in spirit are one with or in communion with God and the saints. And since we're supposed to stay in communion and communication with God and the saints, it means, Jean is saying, that we are supposed to stay in communion and communication with our loved ones in spirit because they are one with God and the saints. So his point is, what we have been told about the afterlife is dead wrong, if you'll pardon the pun. We're not supposed to live in an emotional wasteland separated from those we love, waiting until we die and enter heaven, because heaven is all around us. Heaven is here and now. As Jean said, Jamie, death's an illusion. There's a very thin veil between the realm where you are and the realm where I am. The veil is thinner than you can ever imagine. I'm standing right here. The point, reconnect now, okay? Now, one other misconception that I wanna say is the idea that once they're in heaven, they're out of reach. People often say this. What, there are no cell towers in heaven? <laughs> or our cell signal isn't strong enough to meet heaven. These earthly conceptions are just so not correct. Now, how did I discover that this wasn't right? Well, I went to see Jean's priest, first of all, and he said to me, you know, when he's in heaven, you won't hear from him anymore. Well, this bothered me all day. So all day, all day, it's on my mind. In the evening, I make the circle for a group that I'm running in my house. Everybody's late except a new group member named Ashley. She doesn't know me doesn't know I'm a widow, anything. All of a sudden, we hear ding, ding. That's the sound of my burglar alarm charm chime when the front door opens. And then we hear loud, pounding footsteps. And then nothing. And I said, gee, somebody's stopped in the waiting room adjacent to the group room. Somebody got his time wrong. Now I hear the footsteps pounding in the opposite way to the front door, ding, ding, and the front door opens. I said, excuse me, I gotta go see the person. Now, the time it takes to go from my group room to the front door at the two steps, there's no way I would have missed somebody because the driveway is very long and the parking area is very far from the front door. So I rush to the front door, I open it, there's nobody there. No car, nobody. So I come back and I say, Ashley, there was nobody there. She says, it was a spirit. So that was Jean's answer to, oh, when I'm in heaven, you won't hear from me anymore? Did you hear those footsteps? Okay, so the second half of part two of Love Never Dies is the science behind it. I mean, there's so much science from quantum physics now talking about you know, the survival of consciousness, non-local consciousness, that our bodies and our brains, when we leave our bodies, we just shed the turtle shell. This is a shell and everything else remains. But ultimately what we're talking about is energy, okay? So we are, when we communicate with loved ones in spirit, we're just sending and receiving energetic signals. And think about it, you do energetic communication every day, you just don't realize. Think about when you're parked at a light, you look over at the driver in a neighboring car. Doesn't that driver always look back at you? Because he senses the energetic frequency of your gaze and looks back. 
Twins, how do they know when the other's in trouble on opposite ends of the world? Energetic signals. How do close couples know what the other's thinking? Or how do they know what the other person needs? Energetic communication. So basically, I demystify this whole thing for you. And I say to you, we were all born with the innate apparatus to send and receive energetic signals to and from our loved ones in spirit. It's just a matter of learning how to tune to what I call the spirit channel in your brain. It's like a TV. You just tune to a different channel. Okay? So in part three of Love Never Dies, what I do is I show you how to make your own reconnection without a medium, without a channeler, without a psychic, how you can do it. Now, the first part of part three is how to create a state of receptivity. Because, now, I'm going to quote the Bible, like I said, huh, I didn't know any of this, but John told me right after he left his body, Jamie, the noise of the day drowns me out. Anytime you want to hear me, come to the bed and be still and quiet. And somebody told me, the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. So we have to create pockets of peace. That's the first order of business, to hear our loved ones in spirit, right? Now, there are quite a few other <coughs> techniques that I show you in this chapter, like using hypnagogic or twilight states right before sleep, right before, when you wake up, we're more open to spirit. How to use nature to help you connect with spirit. How to use, I don't even remember my own book. There's just so much. But there's, I have five exercises that are really, really fun for helping you attune to all your five senses. Because remember, spirit beings, out at, once they're freed from the vessel of their body and they are pure energy, they have the power to send signals to all your senses. So the more your senses are tuned up, the easier it's going to be for you to perceive the signs that are being sent to you all the time. Now, speaking of signs, this is the next chapter in part three, recognizing the signs. I can't tell you how many thousands and thousands of people have said to me, you know, whether they call me on Hay House Radio or after I do a TV or radio show, they'll say, I'm not getting any signs. But invariably, when I list out all the signs of spirit presence, everybody says, oh, that happened to me. And so did this, and so did that. So becoming aware of the signs is often all that's needed to begin your process of reconnection. And again, freed from the vessel of the human body, the ways that they send us signs are infinite. They can send scents. They can send sounds. They can send symbolic communications, you know, butterflies, rainbows. And a big one that they like is coins. They love to drop coins on you, which reminds me of a story. I had a patient named Kyla in my office, and I said, this is the anniversary week of Jean's bodily departure. He always drops coins on me, minted the year he left his body. She says, oh, I almost forgot, Jamie. Look at this boot I'm wearing. She said, this week I was in my bedroom when a coin dropped out of thin air and fell in my boot. And she said, I got the message it was for you, and I forgot to take it out. She says, let me give it to you now. So she takes her cowboy boy boot off, hands it to me, and I hear Jean say, you'll see, it was minted the year I left my body. She hands it to me. It was. OK. So now, here's where love never dies takes after-death communication to a whole nother stratosphere. This is freaky. And um, the see, if you, you, you know, what I told you so far isn't freaky. <laughs> this is freaky. OK. <laughs> the CEO of Hay House said to me, Jamie, we've never seen anything like this. So that's how you know it's freaky, because they, they do freaky. So, <laughs> OK, so what I show you next is how you can dialogue back and forth and engage in an actual conversation with the help of open vessels, animals, domestic and wild, humans, who are willing to be used in the service of love and are very open, with the help of earthly props, electronic devices. So let me first just give you an example of the difference between how they communicate with us with a static sign and then how we can bring those signs back to life and have a dialogue back and forth, OK? So this year, it was the anniversary week of Jean's bodily departure. I go to the chiropractor, and I say to Teresa, Oh, I'm going to be giving my first talk on Love Never Dies, and this is the anniversary week of his bodily departure. At that moment, I smell gardenias. Well, that's the scent of sanctity, a sign. But I don't say a word. Teresa looks at me. She says, Jamie, do you smell gardenias? So I said, Teresa, that's the scent of sanctity. Jean is giving us both a sign simultaneously. He's just dropping the sign on both of us, and it's validating 
so we're both smelling it. Later that day, I'm in my office with a patient named Regina. She desperately needs to reconnect with her sister in spirit. So I tell her the story of the scent of sanctity earlier in the day and the smell of gardenias. At that moment, I hear Jean speaking to me and he says, but Jamie, I wish I could give you a bouquet of roses. Now, nobody knows he gave me roses every week. Such a lucky girl. <laughs> so, but, so he gave me roses, nobody knew this. But I heard him saying, I wish I could give you roses, not gardenias. With that, my patient Regina pops up. She says, Jamie, do you smell roses? Now, in that elegant manifestation, what he was doing was, he was dialoguing with me through the help of her as an open vessel, making her smell the roses, saying, Jamie, you heard me right. I made her smell the roses to prove it, right? So now, I'm going to give you just one more example of how we can dialogue and how Jean dialogues with me. So this was this year and it was Valentine's Day. Now, I had just done the Coast to Coast interview and Love Never Dies became an overnight bestseller. It sold out on Amazon. And the next day, I got a call from a guy who heard me and he says, my brains are bursting with messages from Jean for you. <laughs> well, the next thing I know, the guy starts speaking in French and Italian. Now, of course, Jean spoke these languages and I knew phrases that he would say all the time. So the guy, after he says something to me in Italian, he says, Jamie, I'm a hillbilly. I don't know no Italian. This is what he says. I don't know no Italian. I believe you. You know, so, <laughs> so, so now, a couple of days later, it is Valentine's Day. And the guy says, sit down when I tell you what happened now. He said, Jean told me, I want you to send Jamie the photograph of the peach-colored rose. Now, Nobody on the planet knows. Not only did Jean give me roses, they were peach colored. So the guy says, my hands are in my lap. I'm at my computer. When Jean opens up a directory of my wife's photos, she's a professional photographer, and the next thing I know, he opens up a photo of a peach colored rose. And he opens the caption, and the, the photo is called Peaches and Cream. Now, the night before, this guy wrote to me and said, Jean wants you to know your time is now, to which I had written, Jean said to me always, the cream always rises to the top. So, peaches and cream. So, Love Never Dies at this point shows you how you can establish your own dialogue. Now, the dialogue can be simply to say goodbye if you want to, for, if someone was ripped from you due to sudden accidental death or illness. It can be to obtain guidance because our loved ones in spirit are here to guide us, right? It can also be just, for the most important point of all, to resolve unfinished business. Because I show you how to use my meditation for making contact, and then how to dialogue back and forth, orally and in writing, and you do this back and forth conversation until you arrive at healing. And I have to say, people are calling on the Hay House radio show from all over the world. They've had unfinished business. Somebody's been in spirit for 30 years. They get on the phone. We do the meditation for making contact. We dialogue. Healed. It is so magnificent. So, and I want to just say one more point before maybe we'll do a little dialogue. But th this one point that I want to say, which is so reassuring for everybody, Often you have to wait until somebody leaves his or her body to work it out. You actually have to wait. One of my patients said, you know, I wish my mother would hurry up and die so we could work this out. Now, and it, it's because he had become familiar with what I'm doing. Why is that? It's because in spirit form, they see where they screwed up with us. And how did I discover this? It was the first week after Jean left his body, and I went to do the car thing. They didn't know me because Jean did the car thing. I walk in and Debbie says to me, hi, uh, and I say Jean died of a bee sting and she says I'm a widow too. With that, her husband beats down my door to send me this message for her. He says, tell her to stop making the same mistake that I made with our son because now she's creating the same power struggle. Now this blew my mind because it said to me he had to be out of his body to realize how he was messing up. Now, the second thing that is so important to know about dialoguing with loved ones in spirit is that they need us to confront them. As much as we need to resolve our unfinished business, they need it too for their own spiritual development and evolution. Now, how did I figure this freaky thing out? <laughs> well, I, it was Good Friday. 
And Jean says to me, go see Lainey, the bird lady. We had had a canary we couldn't save, and she tried, and we eventually had to put the canary down. I didn't know Lainey personally, but he sent me there. So it's Good Friday, I walk in, and as soon as I walk in, there's a cage with a little beautiful Gouldian finch, not looking good. The bird's slumped over and puffed up. It's about on its last leg or its last wing. I don't know what you say about birds. So she says to me, this bird has not eaten in two days, and if it doesn't eat by tonight, it will be dead. So I said, Lainey, can I try to help this bird? She says, OK. So I go over to the cage, put my cheek against the bars. Normally, a bird would freak, but the bird doesn't freak. And now I begin to energetically communicate with the bird, but I speak aloud so Lainey can hear me. I say to the bird, I want you to go down to your seed bowl right now and start eating. The bird instantly obeys. He starts scarfing up seeds like a little mini vacuum. The more he scarfs, the stronger he starts jumping and flitting, and he's doing good. Well, now I'm aware of a female presence. It seems like it's Lainey's mother in spirit. She says, tell Lainey I'm sorry I was such a weakling that I didn't protect her from him. So I just repeat this because it's a very odd term word, weakling. She says, that's my mother. She always called herself a weakling. Well, now I look back at the bird. The bird's not looking good again. He's craning his neck up, and he stopped eating. Now I'm aware there's another presence. It's the him. So I say to the bird, don't worry about this. Go back to eating. I'll help her with this other spirit presence. The bird goes back to eating, and now the male presence says, I know you're still scared of me because I molested you sexually, and I am begging you to confront me because I know you're stuck as a little girl is stuck and I need you to make me face what I did. I'm stuck too and I can't be in peace until you confront me. So I say this to her. She bursts into tears and she says, it's true. So we do the dialoguing back and forth and she arrives at peace with him. So this is why I'm so excited. I'm ashamed to say I have a passion, but what can I say? You know. <laughs> So, so, I'm sorry, I can't help it, he did it to me. So, uh, one last point, and then let's try a meditation and the dialoguing. This last point, we all know what our purpose on earth is, right? What are we here for? This is our love lap. It doesn't matter what your unique calling is, it's all the same. To overcome the blocks to loving ourselves and others fully. Now, I am the poster child for how difficult it is to love yourself when you've been raised by abusive parents. My parents beat me physically, they beat me verbally, and even though, you know, I did a lifetime of work and I lived for 27 years with this guy who adored me, there was still a part of me inside that didn't love me well enough, that beat me down in my head bad. No matter how successful, no matter what I published, it was in there, like the Prego tomato sauce, it's in there. So. <laughs> I have to make a joke or I'll cry, right? So they say the funniest people and the clowns are the saddest, so I'm very funny. So, so anyway, after Jean leaves his body, I go to my professional group and I say to all these top shrinks, listen, I gotta resolve this. I can't get my parents' voices to shut up. So they said, well, just yell louder. Let us yell them to the, into submission. That never worked, never. So I go home. And I am crying, and I am begging Jean, please, I am begging you to help me. Please, I've got to get their voices to stop tearing me down. And all of a sudden, Jean appears to me as the embodiment of love. He's surrounded in golden light. He takes my face in his hands, and he turns me toward him in the light. And he says, Jamie, listen, listen, listen to me. Let my love for you fill you. And in that moment, a miracle happened. His love for me became my self-love. And what I discovered was that freed from the vessel of the human body, he could enter me, his love, his soul could enter me unimpeded in a way that it never could when he was obstructed by the human vessel. So the point of all of this is, by reconnecting with your loved ones in spirit, you are allowing yourself to be showered in this eternal love that they hold for you and allow them to fill the well inside you to overflowing. And now you have an abundance of love that you can share with the world through whatever your calling is. And that is love never dies.
So who would feel brave enough? Game. Would you like to come up and do a meditation and a dialogue, or just want to ask me? Qu She's up. <laughs> this is the bold action step. Okay. Well, how about another? Do you have another stool? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Okay, one. That's great. I, I don't want to loom over you, so I thought I would just take a. Okay. 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 Alrighty. Now, everybody, we can do this together. Let's do the meditation, and then everyone will be with you. Okay. okay? So, everybody, close your eyes. Take a deep breath in for a count of five and let it out. And another deep breath in for a count of five and let it out. And again for a count of five and let it out. In for a count of five and out. In for the count of five, let it out. In for the count of five, and let it out. In for the count of five, and let it out. In for the count of five, and let it out. In for the count of five, and let it out. And one last time, in for five, and let it out. Now I want you to imagine your crown chakra is opening. That's the top of your head, and you're gonna feel this golden light from heaven and spirit and all your loved ones in spirit just entering the crown chakra, and it's drifting down your body, starting at your temples, your face. Allow it to wash over you and feel it as this warm golden light having the power to penetrate your blood, your organs, your cells. And feel yourself sinking deeper and deeper into the chair as this golden light is washing down your neck, your chest, your upper back, your mid-back, down your arms, out your hands, down your legs, your mid-back and lower back, your quadriceps and the back of your legs, your shins and your calves, and your insteps and out your feet. And as you sink deeper and deeper, see yourself in a well bucket being dropped lower and lower or an elevator dropping deeper and deeper. And when you feel free of tension and worry, if you sense any area that is holding tension, just breathe into it and flush it out. And when you are ready, Nisha, just say, okay, take your time. Keep breathing and sinking. Okay. Now we're going to do my meditation for making contact. So we're all going to imagine we're walking beside you along the bank of a stream. The sky is a perfect blue dome and butterflies and birds are accompanying us on our stroll. And as we walk with each step, we come, become more and more weightless, as if we are just floating above the earth. And we across the stream on this far shore that's a perfect emerald meadow. And beyond this shore, we see a silver lake. Its surface is smooth as glass. And on the far side of this lake is the person that you need to connect with. So we're going to just teleport over the lake to this far shore. And now what we're going to do, Misha, is I want you to make a first statement to the person you need to speak to and call him or her by name. 
Keep your eyes closed. Hi, Mom. Hold on one second, Misha. We need a mic for you. Say what you wish to say to Mom. Go ahead. Don't worry. Hi. Um, I need to feel you more with me. How can I do that? Take another breath in, Misha. Now I want you to see if you have a thought in your mind, a picture, a feeling, anything that comes to you from mom. You're holding back because you can hear what she's saying to you. She's telling you something very specific. Just blurt out what you hear. I'm with her. Right? But she didn't say I'm with her. She said I'm with you. So when you dialogue, you speak her words too. Okay? I am with you. Now, say back to her, Misha, what you want to say in response. I don't, I don't feel you. Okay. Take another breath in. Now, what do you hear her saying now? She's also giving you a feeling. You feel? Yeah. I feel her right at my third eye. Right? She's like right there. And what is she telling you? Because she has a lot to say to you. Do you want me to help you? Yes. She's saying that you are so sad, you are missing her so much, that it is actually blocking you from feeling how present she is. Does that sound right? Yes. When we are so sad, it blocks the sending and the receiving of signals. And she's saying that if you would allow her to enter you, you won't be so sad. Take another breath in, Misha. There's something else you want to say to her. And it's negative. Are you aware of that? Yes. And she's saying that you can say it now. So say it. <sighs> and you don't need to protect her. She doesn't need that. How could you let him do that to us? How could you let him separate us? Right, right, right. Now when you ask the question, you want to understand, but what you're really not saying is, I'm mad at you. And that's what you need to say. <laughs> and she has an eternity to work this out with you. You don't need to hide how mad you are, because she knows it. Now, do you hear what she's saying as to why? You want me to help you again? Yes. She's saying that she came from abuse. She didn't know any better. She's ashamed of this, that nobody ever showed her how to stand up for herself against an abuser. This is what she's saying. Do you know this about her? I don't. Well, this is what she's saying. So here's the thing. There needs to be a lot of conversation between you and her. And you haven't been connecting because you're mad at her. And when we're mad, it's like a huge barricade. So it is an absolutely wonderful beginning that we will continue. Because she's ready to keep talking with you about this. And we will talk back. 
and forth. I mean, obviously, I didn't even look at, you know, the signal here, but I have a feeling I'm out, outstaying my welcome. I'm okay. Is there one more thing you want to say to her before we say we'll continue the dialogue? I need you to be here for me now like you weren't. Okay. Then. Okay, so now take a breath in again. Now, do you hear what she's saying about this? Now, this is very big. This is what's been blocking you. Again, you're so pissed at her that you're not aware that she is here. She has got her hand on your shoulder. She's trying to do everything she can to let you know that she is here with you now. And because you've been so mad, you haven't been letting her in, and you haven't been feeling that she's giving you exactly what you want. She is here with you now. And she is saying that if you even feel like kicking and screaming, she's here with you. She's just holding you, Misha. Can you feel that? And how do you feel? She used to do this to your hair, right? She, oh, she wanted me to do that for you. Now, that is such a specific gesture. No one's ever given me that gesture before. Now, that just underscores how present she is to you every minute. How do you feel? Calm. Calm is a big deal. Yeah. Considering the ride we've just been on, that's a big deal. And it's a, you were very, very brave to begin this work. Just as in you know, our earthly relationships, we don't necessarily work everything out in the first dialogue, but boy, have we come a long way. OK? Yeah, my heart was racing when I got up here, and now it is totally calm. calm. Excellent. Thank you so much for beginning that process. You're so Thank brave. You. Thank you. Okay. Very brave. That was wonderful. So Love Never Dies is being made into a TV show that I'm going to host and also a film, but I must thank all of you for helping me see another piece of my bigger game. And it's by meeting all of you and experiencing your incredible, how evolved you all are, how each one of you is living a true higher purpose. I realized that I want to bring other coaches to a training where I teach them how to do my transformational trans-dimensional grief therapy method. So that's going to be ne the next thing that's going to happen, and you've really inspired me in that regard. So I want to thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Thank you.